um, you know, Jacob put Joseph up as the favorite one, even though he was the intended son. Um, and so uh, you could imagine, right, um, in that circumstance, in that situation, I know, um, you know, if we look at it now, that's just you know something that happens, you know, maybe, and if we look at it just as a story from the Bible. But imagine, like, if you were one of the brothers, right, in that family, like that's all you look at, and that's your life. And you see that, and the father's always favoring Joseph, um, so uh, the other brothers were jealous. Right? The other brothers were jealous, and um, it came to the point where they were about to kill him. But instead, uh, instead of killing him, what they ended up doing was throwing him into slavery. Right? And so that's what happened. He ended up as a slave in Egypt. And so Joseph was a slave for the Egyptian general, his name was Potiphar, and um, he actually did a great job, you know, Joseph. So this is how it's recorded in the Bible. He became a slave uh, for the general Potiphar, uh, but he did a great job, and so actually Potiphar put, them, put him at the highest, as the highest servant in the house. He was in charge of the whole household of Potiphar. Uh, but um, what happened even then, even as a uh, the head servant for Potiphar, uh, Potiphar's wife, tempted him, right? And so Potiphar's wife was tempting Joseph. Uh, but what did Joseph do? Joseph, he didn't give in. Right? Joseph didn't give in at all. In fact, he resisted her advances, uh, but then uh, she lied about the situation. She said, hey, Joseph did something, you know, this and that. And so, you know, Potiphar got angry at that and then threw uh, Joseph in jail, right? And so once again, Joseph ends up in a bad situation through no fault of his own, right? Was it his fault that, you know, Jacob, his father, you know, favored him, and, you know, Joseph was also, you know, very, you know, just overall, he was a, it's recorded in the Bible that Joseph was just a good boy. So that wasn't his fault, right? When his brothers got jealous of him, um, the situation with Potiphar's wife, um, that was Potiphar's wife who tempted and lied about the situation, um, and it wasn't his fault either, but he gets thrown into jail. And so, you know, I mean, think about Joseph, right? Joseph, you know, in all situations, he could have easily, um, you know, let's take, for example, the situation with Potiphar's wife. He could have easily give, given in to her, right? Given in to the temptations and her advances. Um, he could have, you know, done those kinds of things, but um, he showed determination throughout all. He kept pure. He wanted to stay pure and stay true to God. Right? And so that's how Joseph was. But despite that, you know, he was stayed pure. He was determined to that. Uh, but still, even despite that determination to stay pure and stay true to God, he ends up in this kind of situation. And right? he's just like thrown into jail like this. And so uh, that's what I really want to talk about Joseph and relate it to ourselves. It's that, like Joseph, uh, we can face sufferings, trials, Temptations, right? And uh, and it's the and all, all, very often we just want to give in to those kinds of things, right? Just play nice with the world, play nice with those things, um, and so we can easily fail, right? We can easily fall when trials and tribulations and sufferings and temptations um, come to us. Um, you know, this this really happens to us a lot when we get. I think this happens to me when I get like extremely stressful. Right? When you have a lot on your plate and you're in a bad situation and a lot of things are on you, uh, we easily give in to stress, temptation. You know, people, when they get really stressed, they even eat a lot, right? And so they call that stress eating, so you eat a lot, right? And so we give in even to that temptation, but not, such, not just that, but we give in to other temptations as well, too. And so, you know, that's how temptation comes. It comes through, you know, all angles at us, you know. And, and you look in the Bible, it's like all the five senses. You see that temptation can come through all the five senses, from all angles. And, you know, we need to pray that we don't fall into that temptation. You know, that's what the Lord's Prayer says. The Lord's Prayer says, lead us not into temptation. You know, we should not fall into temptation. Lead us away from that, Lord. Please help us, right? And so... You know, Jesus, he talks about this in the Sermon on the Mount, too. He says that if there is this kind of temptation, and that's usually, you know, especially in this day and age with the internet and, you know, with all kinds of temptations, you know, the sexualized world that we live in, you know, what does Jesus say about those? He says, cut it off. He says, cut off your, gouge out your eyes and cut off your hand. Well, he's not really, like, saying, it's like all Christians, you know, we really, we're 
one eye and one hand is, that's not what he's talking about. But he's saying, you know, we've got to cut off the pathways, right? It's actually through the eyes and through the hands that, you know, the lust comes, right? And he's talking specifically in this passage, you know, about that, right? About lust. And he's saying, cut off, gouge out the eye and cut off the hand. And that's cutting off the pathways to sin. And so, you know, what are the things that are tempting us and we have to cut it off, right? And so, you know, really, you know, that's, you know, that, that's, that's how we are. We fall into these kinds of temptations easily. And we're weak. And so, you know, the truth is, is that, you know, that will happen. We will probably fall into temptation because we are so weak. And so we have to seek the Lord, right? More than my power and my will in order to block or cut off sin, um, the Lord's power. Right? That's what cleanses us. When we seek the Lord, right, His power comes to us and it helps us. And so, you know, I really think, especially in this day and age, with the internet and all this impatience, um, you know, young people, we really need to unite more uh, with Christ, right? Um, because all those temptations come. And avoiding them is hard. And so, you know, uniting more with Christ when we are with Christ, uh, He gives us the strength really to overcome it. And even if we do, you know, fall into those temptations, then, you know, rather than just, you know, some portioning, we should seek Christ more, right? We continue to seek it more, um, we will avoid it, and uh, he'll help us, right? And so, you know, Joseph, we have to really remember it's that he was a person just like all of us, right? He is not like someone particularly, like he has some special superpower. Right? You know, we don't look at the Bible like they have some secret power in them. No, they were just regular people, just like us. Um, but what was the power for Joseph to overcome all of this? Right? It is his relationship with the Lord. Right? He was able to overcome it. Um, I mean, he could have easily, like I said, he could have easily given in to those temptations, but he overcame it by relying on God, by being united um, with the Lord. And that's how he was, Joseph, really, coming from this family of faith. He was really united with God. We see that from a young age. And he was able to, you know, when the temptations came, even when he was in, in the place of suffering, he was able to overcome like that. Right? And so, you know, we should be like that too, right? If there is suffering, uh, let's not be the ones that, you know, uh, just, you know just give in, uh, but let's seek and be united with the Lord uh, even more. And so Joseph, Joseph was like, so we should learn from the example of Joseph. He remained pure, persevered, and endured suffering. And just like we read in James last time, uh, through the perseverance and the trials, it's receiving uh, the crown of life. So we should be rewarded. We should receive the crown of life. And so I think that you know when you really look at Joseph, uh, he suffered and suffered and suffered for two years, really suffering in jail like that. But um, you know, even despite that, it's not like, you know, when he was even in the two years in jail, do you think that Joseph was giving into this temptation or giving into that temptation? Well, I think, you know, I don't know, maybe he wasn't perfect, you know, he's not, of course he's not Jesus, but uh, I think though, still, he was united with the Lord and the Lord helped him through, right? And I do believe that he would be pure throughout, and he waited, he waited and waited and waited and suffered and suffered and suffered for two years, um, but... But even in the midst of the suffering, he stayed pure, and then what happened is he got the opportunity, right? And so he got the opportunity. And so that's what happened, right? He suffered and suffered and suffered, uh, but he remained really, really united with the Lord, even amidst the, the, the suffering, right? Um, and it was still like the same circumstance every single day for two years like that, and it seemed like there was no hope. But then, you know, all of a sudden, in one day, right, there is the opportunity, right? And what we records here that we just read is that Pharaoh needed to someone to interpret his dreams, right? And so it's like almost like an unfathomable type of situation, right? Like you're the person stuck in jail, like no one knows about you, the brothers have forgotten about you, even you know what the brothers did? The brothers even lied to the father and said that Joseph was dead. Right? And so the father didn't even know to look for Joseph because he thought that Joseph was dead. Right? And so you know, no one knows about you. You're really in the pits of the world. And, and you know, no acknowledgement, nothing, but all you have is just you and God. Right? It's just him in jail, him and God. And then this other completely different situation, 
you know, with the Pharaoh, that he needs his dreams interpreted. Now think about it, Pharaoh doesn't know anything about Joseph, anything about that, but, you know, God knows, right, God knows. And so God knows about Joseph, and so God, he does something in Pharaoh, he, like, he gives them these dreams, and Pharaoh needs someone to interpret these dreams, right? And so, you know, what are the dreams? And so we just read it, right? And so the dream is basically that there were seven nice fat cows, right? But these fat, nice, sleek cows were being eaten by seven skinny, ugly cows, right? <laughs> that was basically the dream, right? Seven nice, fat cows being eaten by seven skinny, ugly cows like that, right? And then he had a second dream. It was basically the same thing, but it was grain, right? So there were seven healthy grains, right? But then these were eaten by seven sickly uh, heads of grain stalk, right? Like that. And so, uh, actually, when you look at this context, uh, Pharaoh, in Pharaoh's religion, right? In the Egyptian religion, you know, of long ago, their spiritual faith of long ago, uh, cows were something very sacred, right? And so cows were like a very sacred animal. You can look it up. It was like a sacred animal in the, the, the Egyptian uh, religion, kind of like that. And so, um, you know, think about it. It was like, that's like a very horrifying dream. And so for them, they really regard cows as very sacred, right? And so it's like a very horrifying dream to have that kind of dream, to have seven nice ones be eaten up by, you know, seven, seven you know, sickly, ugly ones like this. It's something very, um, you know, very horrifying, right? And there's another component to uh, the Egyptian, you know, beliefs and the culture of the time. For them, a pharaoh was the mediator, right? So between, you know, the gods and man, uh, pharaoh, right, pharaoh was the mediator, right? And so, you know, for us, you know, God, and then us, you know, Jesus Christ is the mediator, obviously, right? Uh, but for them, it was like whoever is pharaoh, you know, at the time, right? And so, if pharaoh is having this sort of, like, like, dream, right? This very horrifying, like, dream, then, you know, it means something to them that, you know, something's going to be happening to, um, you know, all the peoples, right? All the peoples in Egypt, right? The gods are going to be doing something horrible to all the peoples. And so, you know, Pharaoh's very, like, worried about this because he got this horrifying dream and he is the mediator. And so he's asking everybody, but the problem is, is no one can interpret, like, what's going on, right? And so, um, but, you know, very fortunately, like someone that Joseph helped out like two years ago. And so, you know, this guy was kind of bad too. He kind of forgot about Joseph for two years. He should have said something probably, you know, in those two years beforehand, but he didn't say it. But anyways, he forgot. And that was that. But anyways, he didn't remember, right? And so, you know, suddenly Pharaoh has this dream. And so this guy that Joseph helped out, you know, from two years ago remembers, oh, Joseph helped me out, he interpreted my dreams long ago, and his dreams, his interpretations were very accurate. And so, um, you know, he remembers that because, you know, actually this guy who Joseph helped was in jail with Joseph before, he is not really anything either. He's not really like an influential or any person with great power. All he is is the person who serves the wine to Pharaoh. Right? He's a servant. He serves the wine to Pharaoh. But, you know, the fact that he serves the wine to Pharaoh, he's in the right place at the right time. Uh, when everybody else can interpret the dream, he, he is able to be there and say something like, oh, you know, someone from two years ago. And so, you know, really, um, you know, Joseph is in jail, and he's the forgotten person in the deep, dark pits of the world. But, you know, how great is God? How great is God? God, you know, in this completely other way that you can't imagine, uh, he uses things. He remembers everything. He remembers all of the sufferings of Joseph, how he persevered, how he didn't give in to temptation, you know, how he, you know, helped out, you know, another person even when he was in jail. Um, you know, Joseph is the one who persevered through all of that in the most difficult situation. And even when it doesn't seem like there's any hope, like he's just going to be stuck in that situation forever and ever and ever. But what we have to know is that God knows. And God knows. And God gives the opportunity, right, for, for him to Joseph to be able to deliver his message, right? God has a message to deliver, and he gives the opportunity for Joseph to deliver. 
deliver that message, right? And so, you know, think about it. If um, you know Joseph, you know, uh, you know, there's no advisors um, in the world that you know the Pharaoh is seeking. He's the Pharaoh. He's like the most powerful. So he can find many, many other advisors to help him, but you know, no one can help him, right? But Joseph, Joseph is able to help him, but think about it, if Joseph wasn't in this particular circumstance where he was in the jail and you know there was a cupbearer and all these things happened, then Joseph wouldn't have had the opportunity even to be in this position to interpret Pharaoh's dreams, right? You, you, know, you know, I mean, this, this was sort of like some really coincidental opportunity. He was just sort of, you know, with his family and whatnot in a land far away from Egypt. You know, there wouldn't be this opportunity, but because Joseph was in this situation, he was a guy who was able to use that in order to help this very important person, Pharaoh, right? And so uh, that's how God is. God provides the opportunities to be in the right place at the right time. And so that's the same for us. That's how we should view our life. That even if we're suffering, and even though it's hard, rather than just giving in to temptation, what we should be thinking is, God is using you know, my circumstance, right? My suffering, my right time, right place to use me greatly. And Joseph was ready, right? Joseph was ready. He was the one who remained pure. He persevered. He endured the suffering. He was not asleep when God called him, right? Because think about it, God can even like create all of these circumstances, right? But then if you're completely asleep at that time, right, then you know, you know, then maybe you won't even, you know, be be there and, and, and miss the opportunity. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 13 through 20. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 13. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is the light that makes everything visible. That is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so, um, we see that. And so here, um, what is uh, Apostle Paul speaking about? He's saying, make the most of every opportunity. Right? If we're asleep at the moment that the opportunity should come to us, um, then we'll miss it. Like God has prepared everything. That's how God works. God loves us. He's so great. And God he prepares even the littlest, tiniest things along the way for our whole life. He even takes all of the suffering and everything we face in the past and uses it for good. But he prepares all of that and gives us that opportunity. But if we're asleep, right? If we're asleep, we're we're not pure, let's say. Let's say we're not pure, and then we're following, we're falling into evil and darkness. Right? That's what happens very often. We fall into evil, darkness, you know, temptation of sin, right? Things, you know, on the internet, you know, all of these 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 temptations and all these things, we don't remain pure. And then we're drunk off that sin, and then we're falling asleep, you know, we'll miss the opportunity. That's what Paul is speaking about. There were so many, there's so many people. Think about it. I think there's been a lot of people throughout all of history that you know God has prepared so many things, so many opportunities. There's probably many, many things in our own lives that we've missed, right? That God has prepared so many, so many things, but you know, we were we were falling asleep. Right? But that's not Joseph here, right? What we see is that despite his suffering, you know, God shines the light in the darkness and works in the Holy Spirit, and that's what he'll do to us too, right? He'll work in the Holy Spirit through us if we remain faithful, right? And then if that's the case, God will convey a message to us like Joseph. So let's continue on. Let's look at Genesis 41, and in verse 25 through 36. Genesis 41, and in verse 25 through 36. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh that what he is about to do. 
the seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are the seven years, it is one and the same dream. The seven lean ugly cows that came up afterwards are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east when they are the seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming through the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all of the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance, the abundance in the land will be remembered, because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man, and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. That Pharaoh will appoint a commissioner over the land, and take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of the good years that are coming and store up the grains of them under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. The food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be uh, ruined uh, by, um, by the famine. So, um, how does Joseph interpret the dreams? And so he says that the seven years, the seven cows or the seven grains that were nice looking, these are uh, the seven years of abundance, right? And then the seven ugly ones are seven years of famine. And so what Joseph recommends, right, he says prepare them for the famine, right? And so, you know, you should take a fifth, right? And so, you know, actually if you're preparing for seven years, all you have to do is take a seven, right? But, uh, you know, a seventh every year in order to prepare for the other seven years, but he says take a fifth, and so get extra, right? And so, you know, save up, save up and store up during the seven years of abundance to take, you know, to take a fifth. Um, and uh, when the trials and tribulations come and there's no few food, you know, we'll have stored up the food while we still can, and then we can use it at that time, right? And so, you know, think about this. Uh, for Joseph, you know, how is he able to, you know, interpret these dreams? So what we need to really understand about Joseph being able to interpret these dreams is not, is not that he has some kind of special ability. Right? It's not that he has some special ability, he has some sort of magic power or something like this. Uh, it's just, simply speaking, that he was a person of faith, he remained pure, and so that he was not drunk on sin, and so when it came time to listen, and so he was listening, he had the opportunity, and he was listening, he was in tune with God. Right? He had remained pure, he was in a relationship with God, and so he was in tune with God, and so when God gives a message, it's very clear to him, like, like exactly what God is saying, right? And so, you know, being in tune with God, you know, that's what, you know, he, he has that understanding of God's ways and how God works. And so when God does speak and communicate, you know, sometimes we will be confused, right? Like, you know, what does that even mean? Like, seven cows, seven grains, you know, the ugly ones, and then they're eating up, like, you know, what does all that mean? And then, so, you know, those kinds of things can come into our life, right? And so, you know, there's this, and then there's that coming in my life, and I don't understand what's going on, and there's a lot of events happening, and they don't really make sense. But, you know, what we have faith in is, is God is good. And God has given us the word, and God has given us the complete truth through his son, Jesus Christ. And so, you know, being in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ and studying his word and being in tune with him, then, you know, when all of these circumstances come to us, right, then, you know, it's very clear, right? I, I can tell you it is really very clear. You know, the more we study the word and the deeper and more mature we get in our relationship with Jesus Christ, you know, we see that all the events happening in my life, it's not just like random, and it's not like it just has like no meaning at all, but oh, it's like very clear, like oh, like this is happening and that is happening, and that's because it's God's will, right? And it's because God's will, and He is good, and He is guiding me towards Him, him and His kingdom, and towards His will and His purpose, and it makes sense, right? And it becomes clear, right? And so that's why we have to see that, you know, Joseph's interpretation of these dreams is not some mysterious, magical mystery, you know, like that. It's something we have to really see for our own lives, right? That all the things happening in our lives is not some magical mystery, but it's just really being in tune with God, His will, and His purposes, right? And so because Joseph was so in tune, 
You know, that's why it's like very clear. Like something like that is said, and then so it's like, you know, you know, and that's why when he speaks and he interprets, it's very accurate and wise, and he has insight into the meaning of the dreams, right? And so, you know, what does that teach us about ourselves too? So what is the way to gain insight, you know, about our lives and about everything around us? And so, you know, if we are entrenched in the world and entrenched in sin and in temptation and not pure and looking at all the garbage that is out of the world, and then when things are happening in our lives, then it, it, it will be confusing, right? It does become a mystery, right? <laughs> you know, that is what happens because there's so much fake things in the world and the fake things obscure, like true things, right? And then so we're just like entrenched in it and then all the things happening in our lives, it's a mystery, right? And we just fall into despair um, because like we don't really understand what's going on in my life. And so you see why there's so much you know, depression and darkness and misunderstanding in the world and so much sickness in the world. Right? There's so much sickness in the world because we can't see the truth, right? It's obscured by all the fake, false, impure things of the world. But, you know, the one who, you know, you know, we are weak uh, and it is hard to stay pure, but we need to really keep that relationship with God. And when we do have that love in our hearts and His will and purposes, you know, are inside of us, then when all the things are happening, you know, it all becomes clear, right? It, it all becomes clear. And so, you know, I really remember when I was young in faith, one of the, the striking things I felt about, like, you know, like I had, it was literally when I was, you know, in college and I was an evangelist that came to know Jesus for the first time, you know, when I was 20 years old like that. And, you know, you know, I, I, you know, I was reading just like various stories. I read about, you know, uh, Jesus giving the parables of heaven or speaking about Zacchaeus and, 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 you know, or just like stories, like, like regular stories that you know in the Bible. You know, I would be reading these and applying it to our life and I thought, oh, the word of God is like a superpower. You know, that's what I thought. You know, so we were talking about that, right? It's like, oh, Joseph, he, you know, it's not, he doesn't have any, you know, particular superpower or magic or anything like that. But, you know, actually there is such thing like that in the world. There is such thing as like that because the wisdom of God, you know, when you look at all the false and fake things of the world, you know, the word of God is actually like that. It is like superpower. You know, you, you, you read the word of God, and then it comes to you and clarifies things in your heart and in your life and everything else that's going on in the world too. And it lets you see things. And that's what I really felt when I first learned the Word of God like that. I really thought, oh, it's a superpower because I'm seeing things exactly how they actually are and not this like obscured fake things like I couldn't, you know, I couldn't see before, right? And so, you know, that's what happened in Joseph. Joseph um, that's that's why he's able to interpret. And you know, here's something further. You know, here's something further. I'll tell you about Joseph and how, why and how he was able to interpret the dreams. And so, not only did it help. You know, not only did did um, did the dream, right? Did the dream that Pharaoh gave him. Not only was it able to help him see just like the situation of what was going to happen in Egypt and, and, and the flow of, of the world and what was happening in Egypt, it also helped him understand his own life as well too, right? Or you could say the other way around too. You could say that his own experiences in his own life helped him interpret the dream. I think it goes both ways, right? I think it goes both ways. And so this is what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that his whole life and experience up until now, you know, when the dream came to him, I think it must have been shocking to Joseph. He wasn't just interpreting it for the sake of Egypt in terms of what exactly, like, technically is going to happen with this famine and whatnot, but I think he really saw that, well, hey, in my life, like, this is the moment, this is the opportunity, this is where everything of my life was kited up until this moment now, and that God had a plan for me all along. And so think about it. Joseph, he had good times in his life, right? He was the loved one, the favored one by his father. And then clearly, we also saw bad times in Joseph's life as well, too. And so he faced good times and he faced bad times. But what was Joseph like, whether it was a good time or whether it was a bad time? He realized, he, he was faithful to God and he realized that 
all the good times and all the bad times, it was under, still under God's sovereignty, right? Amen. That God was protecting me no matter what, and he was guiding me no matter what. Amen. And so, you know, really being faithful, that's what we have, we have to interpret our lives as well, too. There are going to be good times in our life. There are going to be times of suffering and tribulation also in our life. But when we are faithful to God, we, it's, it's like in the good times, we don't say, well, it's the good times, I'm arrogant, and I, and I just think it's all because of me, and I did everything, right? We shouldn't be like that. Nor during the bad times, we fall into temptation, and we say, you know, God is not with me, and then we have bad feelings towards God. You know, it shouldn't really sway in the, in the wind, you know, in the, you know, sway like that, right? But it's that whether it's the good circumstance or bad circumstance, you know, God is the one that's going to carry us through no matter what and fulfill his purpose. And so, you know, let's really reflect on our life. Um, what has happened till now? There must have been good times, there must have been bad times, and all kinds of experiences, but God uses it, right? And so, you know, if you take a look at, a, you know, I, I had this, uh, this vision while I was praying the other day, you know, so there's like a potter, right? And so the potter, you know, what does he do? He takes good pieces and bad pieces of, of clay, and the clay, um, you know, it, it's got, you know, um, you know, you, you, you know if, it, if it's messed up, then you sort of add it together, you mold it, and you know, that's what potters are able to do. You know, a good potter is able to like take the, the good and the bad and mold it together and bring out, and then he makes something. He makes something beautiful. He makes uh, the best out of it. So you know, this final product is more beautiful and unique because even the good and the bad and the blemishes and all of that were, were put together. You know, that's better than let's say like you know you make it in a factory. You know, it's like, it's like that. You make it in a factory and something is so like you know, pristine, and like it looks like so perfect like that, you know, but rather like a, a, a very good potter who is like an artist, right, who's an artist, he takes the good and the bad, and he molds it, and then that's more beautiful, that's like art, right, that, that's really something, like a, a, a better picture, a better story is that than this factory made thing. But, you know, how are we? We're like always like wanting this factory made thing in our life, right? Oh, we want our, we want our, our life to be like so pristine and so perfect, and we want to show this like pristine and perfect image to everybody, but actually, you know, you really, you know, the most feeling you get out of that, that's like fake, it's not real. But what is real is that there is the good and the bad, but God molds it and uses it, you know, cracks and blemishes and all, and the good aspects and all, and he molds it for his glory. Right? And so God shapes our experiences like that. You know, he builds our character. That's, that's what gives a character. That's what gives our life character, right? Is all the good and the bad for his glory, right? And so uh, what is the key through all of that? It's, it's, it's not that it's my power or my will, but it's God's power and God's will. And so remain faithful and trust in him and surrender to him. He is the, he is the, uh, he, you know, he is the potter, we are the clay, and so he used by him, right, in that way. So let's look at this final part, and so let's see what ends up happening to Joseph um, from Genesis 41 through verse 37 through 57. It says, now The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials, so Pharaoh asked him, Can we find anyone like this man who is in the spirit of God? That Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people and are to submit to your orders only. Orders. Only with the respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's ring. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in the chariot as his second in command, and the men shouted before him, Make way! Thus he put him in the charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift a hand or a foot in all of Egypt. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zephenath Panay, and gave him Asenet, the daughter of Kori Pharaoh, priest of On, to be his wife. Then Joseph went throughout the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout Egypt during the seven years of abundance of the land. Produced plentifully, Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of abundance in Egypt and stored it in the cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored up the huge quantities of grain, like the sands of the sea, and it was so much that he stopped keeping record because it was beyond measure. 
Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, Asenet, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my troubles and my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, It is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my sons. The seven years of abundance in Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began. Just as Joseph had said, there was a famine in all the other lands, but in the whole land of Egypt there was food. When all of Egypt began to feel the famine, the people cried out to Pharaoh for food, and Pharaoh told all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph and do what he tells you. When the famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened the storehouse and sold the grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout Egypt. And all the countries came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph, because the famine was severe. So, uh, Joseph suggests putting up someone in charge, and so who does Pharaoh put in charge? But Joseph, right? And so Joseph is lifted to the high place, he, you know, richly, rich robes, the gold ring, you know, the chariot, someone shouting in front, being quite you know, for him, he is put in charge of the whole man. And, he's, and he does. He faithfully follows the instructions of God, he stores up the whole grain for seven years of abundance, and then what happened, that there was a famine for the world, right, at the time. So it wasn't just, you know, famine in Egypt, right, saving up, you know, 170, saved up one fifth. And so really, the, and then it was just overflowing. It was more than overflowing. You couldn't even count them. And so God used him to solve the famine for the world, right? And so, you know, that is what God does. He is the one that uses our circumstances, no matter how difficult, to further his, to further his purposes and bless us all. And so the story is that Joseph was sold into slavery and put into jail, yet he ends up to be in the highest place, resolving the famine for all of Egypt. All his family, later on, they come in, his family, they, you know, they need to get grain as well too, and so that's how he reunites with his family. So he solves the famine for Egypt, his family, and the world as well too. And God used all of these circumstances to overcome all of the past you know, being put, being sold by his brothers into slavery, being put as a prisoner even after he was a servant, you know, he, you know, and God uses it, and he just overcomes. And so, you know, one of the things that he does when he names his first child, Manasseh, right, in verse 51, he said, it is because God has made me forget all the troubles of my father's household. Right? And so that's how great God is. Right? And so, really, when God overturns something, right? when he overturns the circumstance and situation, it gets to the point where, um, you know, we, all of our past sufferings, we don't hold regrets. Right? We, it, there, there's this forgiveness. There's this overflowing forgiveness. Right? And so, that's what we have to know about the love of God. You know, how we are, what we tend to do is that, you know, if there are some past things, we tend to look at those past sufferings and past sins, and we dwell on them, and we linger on them. But that's not how God looks at them. God uses all of them, He flips them around to fulfill His purposes, and when He does flip them around, right, it gets to the point where, you know, we're so, you know, so joyful and so overflowing, that just like Joseph was so joyful and overflowing, that he, God helps us forget you know, all of those past things, right? And he encourages us to go new. And then his second son, he names Ephraim, right? And it says, God has made me fruitful in the land of the summer, right? And so that's really what God did for the whole story of Joseph, right? He makes him fruitful. He uses the suffering. He uses the negative even, right? He uses even the negative circumstances in our life to glorify to make fruitful, right? And so, what is, though, this being fruitful, right? What we should, how, we should, how should we define, and how should we look at being fruitful? So, being fruitful is not self-success, right? That's not what we're talking about here. You know, self-success, self-glory. You know, of course, God does glorify us, and He does give us that. But what we should see, in terms of Joseph and his life, and what is fruitfulness, is that it was a blessing that overflowed to other people. That's what happened. He, he resolved the famine for the world. It was his blessing, his suffering, right? And it wasn't just like overturning the suffering and so that he is like in a nice place wearing nice clothes with a nice position. Right? That's not what we're talking about here. That's not the critical part where, you know, Joseph is just in a nice place with nice clothes and nice possessions and a nice place and whatnot. It was that his grace overflowed to resolve 
you know, much grace for other people, right? Other people who were in suffering and in turmoil, it was like that. That is why Joseph was the victor. And so the same should be applied to us as well too, right? When we pray about God's fruitfulness in our life, you know, we, often, we just pray like that, hey God, you know, can you give me a, uh, you know, <laughs> a nice place, nice position, some money and possessions, and this and that, but, you know, that, that is not what we're talking about when we talk about fruitfulness and God overturning our situation. It is when He overturns my situation so that the blessing can go on others. That there are lost souls out there that are suffering, that are in famine for the spiritual word of God, right? You know, so we should look at this. This is in Amos chapter 8 and in verse 11. Right, so Amos chapter 8 and in verse 11. And it says, The days are coming, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Right? And so there's so many people that are in spiritual famine, right? spiritual thirst, you know, like this. And so grace from us should overflow to the many lost souls. So it's evangelism, it is giving them the grace of, of Jesus Christ that has, that has come to us. And so, um, uh, you know, that's why Joseph is the victor. That's what victory is. Victory is not just self-success, but is this overflowing grace and blessing to others. Isn't that what Jesus Christ in the cross is? Is Jesus Christ the cross and the resurrection? Is that just simply that Jesus, he lost his life and then he gained his life back? No, it's much more than that. Of course all that happened, but the life, the resurrected life of Jesus was overflowing grace and spirit to us all. Right? That was the victory of Jesus that overflowed to us all. And so, you know, we should remember that, right? There's, but there's a famine inside of this world that the grace of Jesus Christ has come to us, and his victory is overflowing from us to other people as well, too. And so, um, really, I really hope that we can um, really persevere through trials and all of that. You know, what gives us that power? We receive the power from Jesus Christ, and we should also learn from the example of Joseph, too. Like, he stored up. Right? I, I should also mention that, you know, as part of today's message, too. We have to store up the grain. So what does that mean? We have to store up the Word. Right? That's like spiritual food. We should store up the Word. The Word guides us. It gives us power. You know, it's that kind of power. It's like a superpower. I, I can say that's a testimony to my life, too. I think, you know, when I look back at my life, right, my life and how God has guided my life, more than anything else in the world, I think it was the fact that, you know, storing up the Word when I was young, Right? You know, storing up the word a lot, like listening to the messages a lot, like really looking at the messages a lot, you know, when I was young and storing that up, I think that overflowed to every other aspect of my life for myself and for others as well too, right? And so, you know, I want to encourage you in that way that, you know, young people, rather than storing up things in the world, store up really the word of God. And then in all circumstances and hardships, you know, God would overturn everything. He showed that with Jesus Christ on the cross. And that victory resonates with us for His glory. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, we thank you, Lord, as we have uh, meditated deeply on this message of Joseph, uh, this great ancestor of faith. Uh, Lord, over the past month, uh, we have been looking at these ancestors of faith. Um, um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, Lord. Um, and so, Lord, um, we have learned really how, um, you know, all the trials and sufferings and misunderstandings and, um, you know, um, and, and also the just, just oh, um, all the kinds of things that we can face in our life, Lord, we know that it's all used by, for your purposes, for your glory, and for victory. Uh, you're the one that gained victory uh, for your son Jesus um, on the cross, Lord. He gained victory for us all, and that victory overflows. And may we, not only uh, may you bless us, Lord, but may we be a blessing to so many 